we'll be talking about machine learning today um, and um, let's get right into it. So machine learning is one of those words that's been really hyped up like this transformer. <laughs> uh, and um, when, so when um, things are really hyped up, it's really hard to um, distinguish signal from noise and figure out what is what. So my hope today is that we'll be able to demystify machine learning. Um, in order to do that, the first kind of question we have to answer is what is machine learning? Um, machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence and um, it uses, uh, go on folks, um, it uses um, math and statistics to um, learn about data and predict things based, predict and classify things based on that data. So that's a very plain definition, but that's really all that it is. Um, and um, now that we kind of know roughly what it is, um, let's find out where can we use it because whenever I'm learning a new piece of technology I like to know where can I use it in production and what 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 are people already doing with it um, so let's look at some use cases uh, the first big one is um, recommendation engines so if you ever bought a book off Amazon and at the end there's a paragraph that says you might also like these items and then it gives you a list of items um, the way Am that Amazon compiled that list is through a machine learning algorithm that looks at your browsing history, it looks at your purchasing history, and a bunch of other things, and um, compiles a list. Same things happen with Netflix and Hulu. When you watch a movie, it gives you a similar movie to watch after you finish the one that you're currently watching. Um, again, widely popular, all over the internet, uh, pretty cool. Next one, um, really sweet one, um, is OCR. This is the only picture of a check that I could find that's free. That's why it sucks. Uh, but um, uh, OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition. And uh, basically, um, if you ever used a banking app and took a picture of your check, um, there's probably a machine learning algorithm behind the scenes that looks at that image of a check, reads the numbers from it, and deposits it to your bank account. Um, the same, same thing happens with a lot of uh, uh, readers and where they scan documents and find names and things like that. So anything that has to do with scanning images and finding words, there's probably a, a machine learning algorithm behind it. Another really amazing one that always impresses me is cancer prevention. Doctors nowadays use machine learning to find cancer. Uh, and, you know, they, they do that in different ways, but uh, one of the common ones is they look at a x-ray images and MRIs and um, a machine learning algorithm looks at an image and finds an anomaly in the image, which is pretty amazing. They also use, researchers use uh, machine learning to look at a DNA of a baby and calculate how likely are they going to have a certain type of cancer. So if you just kind of, um, all right, we're going <laughs> to make a short break here. Uh, if you just kind of think about that for a second, it's pretty amazing uh, that we can use technology to, to save people's lives. And uh, I'm over and over and over getting blown out every single time I read about how people use machine learning in uh, medical space, specifically cancer. Um, now a really hot one. I was literally in LA three weeks ago. <laughs> uh, this is not a picture of me, but uh, the, uh, the image behind it is. But um, self-driving cars, pretty hot right now. Uh, but in the heart of a self-driving car is a machine learning algorithm. It helps it learn how to drive, how to switch lanes, uh, how to park, um, all the things. So uh, it's becoming increasingly important in, in vehicles. Um, not just cars, airplanes too, but airplanes had autopilot for a long time. So um, yeah, anyway, self-driving cars, uh, pretty hot. Uh, that's where you can use it. There are even courses online that teach you how to build algorithms too for self-driving cars, which is they're hard, but you know it works. <laughs> um, so, when should we use machine learning? Uh, there are times when people use machine learning when they shouldn't use machine learning. Um, but um, whenever you have to analyze historical data and answer questions like, "How many customers do we have last month?" or "What's our average um, burn rate in the past six months?" or uh, what was our churn rate? Like any of those metrics, you can use SQL for um, because SQL is great and it works well and it's scalable. And when you have to do historical analysis on, on data, 
SQL does the job. However, when you have to predict the future, machine learning is your friend. So when you have to answer questions like how much money are we going to make in three months or um, what should the price of our product be or is this a picture of a cat or a dog, um, that's when you want to um, use machine learning and, and leverage its algorithms. All right, so we know what it is, we know the use cases, we know when to use it. Next thing we're gonna talk about is math. Yay. <laughs> um, so math is one of those things that when I started learning machine learning, learning machine learning, um, the bridging the gap between math and machine learning was really hard for a while for me, just because I couldn't see where it fits in the process, especially me being a, a very practical engineer that likes to build things. Um, I was pretty scared of it. So my hope with this section is to show you a simple example of how does math fit into this whole thing and from there you can kind of build on top of that and go do things on your own. So if you look at this equation, uh, it's a very simple linear equation. You know, it has h of theta on the left, theta 0 plus theta 1 times x1. Somebody mentioned yesterday because I gave this talk yesterday that uh, thetas are confusing. So you can, instead of thetas, you can imagine emojis. So whatever works. Uh, but um, I took this because I was, at the time I was doing a uh, course and they were using thetas. So I was just like, I'm just gonna use those. Um, so if we calculate the thing on the right, we're gonna get the result that's, you know, which is h of theta. All right, so the next equation is the same as previous one, right? Except thetas are replaced. So we have, um, 3 and um, 0 0.2 replaced, so theta 0 is 3, 0 0.2 is theta 1. And now our equation became a lot simpler and um, the only thing that's missing is x1. So when we get that x1, we'll have all the pieces necessary to calculate h of theta, to calculate h of theta. What's cool about this specific equation, this one, uh, is that it's a backbone of an algorithm called linear regression. So if you have these statistics, you probably did regression. And um, in order to understand why is it pretty cool, uh, let's think about an example. So we're trying to predict someone's salary. And we all agree that the only thing that matters for a salary is years of experience. In real life, you know, you have other things. Uh, it's not years of experience, but in our use case, to make it simple, it's years of experience. So what um, linear regression algorithm would do is it would figure out these thetas through a certain process that we'll talk about later. And uh, once it figures out those thetas, instead of uh, years of experience, uh, it, it would replace x1 with years of experience. So um, if somebody has five years of experience, it would say, okay, three plus 0 0.2 times five. It would calculate a number and whatever the result of that is, uh, that will be your salary in thousands. And that's all that it is. There's really not much more to it. Um, now, as algorithms get more complex, math gets more complex. Machine learning models have equation behind it that spits out numbers, and um, that's kind of what it comes down to. Um, people make it a lot more complicated than it is, given some algorithms are complicated, but it always comes down to equations. Um, I know when I was learning this, I, I was pretty good at math in college, so, but I was still really scared. And I see a lot of people getting discouraged by seeing weird Greek letters and calculus and partial derivatives and matrix multiplications. Um, but I'm here to tell you that you can definitely do it. It will take a long time and you will have to learn calculus. Uh, but if you stick with it long enough, you'll figure it out. So it's not that scary, it's not that bad. You don't have to have a PhD in math, you can figure it out. All right, that's math, we're done with it. We're gonna come back to the equation later when we do an algorithm, but let's talk about two types of machine learning algorithms. First one is called supervised machine learning. Supervised machine learning works with labeled data. So what is labeled data? Uh, imagine if you have two pictures, a picture of a cat and a picture of a dog. On a picture of a cat, you put the label cat. On a picture of a dog, you put a label dog. You feed those into a machine learning algorithm and an algorithm looks at a picture, it looks at the label, and that's how it learns what is the picture of. So you feed it a picture of a dog, it's gonna look at the picture and says, oh, that's a dog, because it's gonna connect the label with it. 
However, on the other hand, there's this other group called unsupervised machine learning algorithms where you don't have label data. Algorithm has to figure out everything on its own. Those are also really cool. Um, I use both of them, uh, but in practice, I mostly use supervised machine learning. Um, so there's kind of a third type, which is semi-supervised, uh, but it basically sits in between. It works with label data, but also has unsupervised things in it. Um, we're not going to worry about that right now. Let's talk about regression. Um, so regression, the official kind of definition is regression is anything that predicts continuous values. When I say continuous values, you can think of it as numbers. So if you want to answer to a question um, of how much money, I think I already said, well, said this, but how much money are we going to make next month? That's a number. Thus, regression could probably solve it. Or if you want um, an answer to a question, um, you know, how many PRs are we going to make next month? Probably can be solved with regression. So uh, we're going to be talking about specifically something called linear regression. It will make it will be cluster cluster it will be cluster clear. I still haven't said it right. I'm going to give up. Um, why is it called linear? It will make that in, it will make sense in a second. Okay, so we'll go back to math again. We saw this equation equa equation. Um, but we're going to look at it a little bit more because it is, again, as I said, the backbone of linear regression. Um, and I'm going to be walking through an example of uh, predicting someone's salary based on their experience. So I'm going to be talking in that context. Uh, we have h of theta, which is a dependent variable. Um, machine learning folks call it a dependent variable, and that's basically the thing you're trying to predict. So in our case, it's uh, what? Salary, right? Um, Usually in practice, unless you're writing MATLAB, people uh, put Y instead of H of theta. So when I code later, you'll see me doing Y. So it's Y, but it's the same thing as H of theta. Again, just letters. Um, theta zero is a constant. X1 is called independent feature, independent variable, also called a feature. Uh, and in our case, it will be years of experience. Um, theta one is called a coefficient. Oh, it's a fancy name. But um, people also call these weights. You'll hear that term too. But basically, coefficients, you can think of them as um, represent, representing of how well a relationship do we have between x1 and h of theta. So imagine you're driving a red car, and we're trying to predict your salary. Coefficient would be pretty low, because the color of your car doesn't really matter. However, years of experience do matter, so the coefficient will be way up. So, that's kind of you know, the, the basic equation and, and its parts. Um, we saw this equation again. We saw this equation before. Uh, and I told you that there's a process that happens uh, to figure these numbers out. We're going to talk about that process right now. Just for the reminder, we're talking about an example where we're trying to predict salary. And in order to understand this intuitively, and we're not going into too much math, is graphing it. Right? So I'm going to plot this on a graph. I'm pretty proud. I made this myself. Um, and um, we have, you know, it's a 2D space. You have x-axis, you know, x-axis, y-axis. On x-axis, we have x1, which is our years of experience. On y-axis, you have h of theta, which is our salary. We have a bunch of these red dots. And um, what these red dots are are real data points from your database. So you ran a SQL query, and you pulled out 50 employees with their respective years of experience and their salaries. And then we have this line, uh, which is basically drawn <coughs> by the thetas. So theta 0 is 3, uh, and that's the y-intercept. And then 0 0.2 is the slope of the line. So you can, you can think of a slope of the line as like how steep the line is. Um, and um, if you think about it, if we have this line, it's fairly easy to predict someone's salary. So if I say I have five years of experience, I would find five here on x1. And by the way, um, questions, I forgot to tell you guys, questions are at the end of the talk. But you know, feel free to write them down. Then you can ask me if you have any. Um, so if I have five years of experience, I would find five on x1. And then I would draw a line up. And then I would read the value off of y-axis. So the question really is, how do we find this line? So. 
This is going to sound weird, but what an algorithm does at start is because it doesn't know anything, it just guesses. It just randomly does a thing, right? So, it, for example, it draws a line right here. And then what it does, it asks itself, okay, so I have these real data points, and I'm going to try to predict the same things as these real data points, and I'm going to see how wrong I am. Um, and there's a thing called a cost function, and what a cost function does, it tells an algorithm how wrong it is. So it's going to calculate a cost function. And all that a cost function is, in this, there's, a, there's plenty of cost functions, but the one that we'll be using is called mean squared error. And all that that is, is basically uh, figuring out, uh, it's summing, um, it's basically taking a difference between the actual value and the predicted value, and then squaring it, and then it's doing that for all of these uh, red data points, um, and then it's summing all of that up. So, um, I can talk later more about cost functions. I don't want you guys to, don't even worry too much about it. But basically, there's a, there's a way of calculating of how wrong this line is, right? And then it draws another line. And then it does it again, and again, and again. So after a few times of doing that, it picks a line with the lowest cost function. Why the lowest cost function? Because if you think about it, when the line is here, the difference between this red dot and its predicted value is pretty big. When the cost function is small, the difference between the predicted value and the actual value is small. So we want that line because that means that our predictions are going to be pretty accurate based on the data that we have. Um, it will never be perfect. If an algorithm is 100% correct, it's wrong. Um, and um, you know, if you can get it 90% correct or 92, 95, that's pretty sweet. Um, and that's really um, all that it is. Now, that algorithm is called gradient descent, and there are whole books written on gradient descent, and I can talk about it for hours and hours and hours. It's fairly simple in its nature, but it has its quirks, and there are different flavors of gradient descent. This whole process is called gradient descent. Um, but that's really all that it is in its nature, and you know, when you have, you know, multiple, you know, if you're trying to predict a salary and now you have, you know, degree and uh, X2 and X3 and X4 and X5 and X7 and, you know, this space becomes multidimensional and kind of things start hard to, become hard to visualize. And as, you know, as, as Jeremy Howard said, who's one of the guys that's amazing at deep learning, you should look him up, uh, you know, gradient descent is very simple and this is how it actually works. But, but us as hum like humans are really bad at visualizing, you know, like 10D spaces. So we all get confused and think it's magic. But this is really all that it is. So uh, that's gradient descent. Uh, before I go into coding, I want to talk about how do we solve machine learning problems in production, at least roughly. Um, so there's four steps. I didn't draw the fourth square, but kind of the zero step here is, uh, step zero is define the problem. You know, make sure everybody knows what the problem is, what you're trying to solve. Once you have that, you have to gather the data, uh, and that can be multiple things. That could be CSV, SQL, <laughs> Kafka streams, logs, whatever, whatever works for you. And then you have to kind of sit down, you know, you also have to clean up the data in this step because there's been a lot of crap. Uh, and then um, you have uh, picking the algorithm, uh, which basically means oh, which algorithm do I think fits best this problem? And then you implement the algorithm. And then you probably go back and then implement the algorithm. You go back, you implement the algorithm. So that's kind of, um, that's all that it, there is to it. I mean, this is very simplified. And keep in mind, like in big companies, each of these steps is a separate team or a separate person. In a smaller company, it's the same uh, person. Um, in the demo that I'm going to do, I already did everything from here to above, which is, this also includes this step zero, right? Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So let's, let's do a little bit of coding, see how this goes. Hopefully nice, but I don't know. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, one more thing. I wanna show you guys something. I just wanna talk about it because I, I had a good question yesterday. So, um, Machine learning or data science, it's called science because it's experiments. Uh, 
these two steps, like you go back and forth all the time. Like you don't, when you start and like there are guidelines on how to do things and there are basic rules about things, but at the end of the day, you don't really know and you have to try things, see what happens, run experiment, basically run an experiment, see what happens and then do it again. Um, so just wanted to say that because uh, some people asked me yesterday and they're like, oh, what, if, what do I do if I have this specific problem? And the best answer is try it. I don't know, try uh, this algorithm. I mean, again, if you, if, so the problem that we had was linear, right? So the data grows linearly. Um, if you have a problem that's going like this, obviously linear regression is not gonna work. Uh, but you know, above those, like beyond those basic rules, it's just try it. There's really no other answer, and it, that answer sucks. But there's uh, really no other answers that, answers than them than that. Okay, so let's do do some coding uh, at the end, please, if that's okay. At the end, yeah, that's okay. All good. All right. So Jupyter Notebooks, um, it's like an ID in a browser. If you never used it, it runs by cell. A lot of machine learning folks like to use it because you can iterate quickly and do experiments quickly. Uh, I use Python. Um, uh, people do machine learning in other languages sometimes, but Python is kind of the dominant one, and I also like Python. So there you go. Uh, if you ever did Ruby, it's very similar. If you ever did Smalltalk, it's very similar. But uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I might, I might go um, you know, over some Python idioms pretty quickly without thinking about do people know it or not. So at the end, feel free to ask questions. So this is basically like a bunch of imports. JavaScript has a similar thing. So we import uh, NumPy, which NumPy is a library for uh, manipulating arrays. We impo imp import matplotlib, which basically is used for plotting graphs. Uh, we import pandas, <laughs> which is a really cool, one of my favorite libraries. And what it does is it allows you to import, it's like doing Excel in code. So you import um, something called a data frame, which is essentially an Excel spreadsheet. And you can import from a CSV, from database from many different places and basically <coughs> you can do all the C you, all the things you can do in Excel you can do in pandas not all but most of the useful ones um, at least for me the useful ones uh, there's this library called psychic learn uh, this is, uh, and we re rely on it heavily so instead of uh, me making my own regression algorithm people already did it so I'm using that however if you really want to know how it works Build it from scratch, 100%. Uh, train test split is something that I'll talk about later, why it's important, but basically it splits data into testing and training data. All right, so let's get right to business. All right, oh and yeah, I, I cheated here. I'm gonna hide this so you guys don't see it anymore. Uh, but uh, I didn't want to remember how to write these three lines of code because I always forget, uh, so I just put it there. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do this. With, so we have a CSV already uh, with something called salary data. I just found it on the internet. Um, in the, this line here, pd.readcsv does exactly that. It reads from a CSV. Um, and uh, let's take a look at it. So head is a method that just grabs first five rows. Uh, so we have years of experience and salary. You know, in this column, years of experience, this is a salary column, and then we have rows. Fairly straightforward. So the first thing we have to do to do linear regression is we have to split our variables up. So on one hand, we have our H of thetas, right? Or Ys, that's how I'm gonna call them here. Um, and on the other hand, we have our Xs or our features. So in this case, um, our Y or our H of theta is a salary and our um, X is years of experience, right? So let's do that. Um, can you? Can you see this? Yeah. Seems pretty big. Yep. Yeah. All right, that's good. It also has autocomplete, which is pretty sweet. Uh, I use Vim, so I don't get that benefit a lot of times. Um, all right, so this is for the rows. So I need all the rows, and I need everything except this, and then. Okay, so I'm gonna explain these two lines. So what this says is, give me all the rows and everything except the last column. I like this convention, everything except the last column, because usually when you get a CSV and you're doing a 
regression type of model is all of the columns before the last one, it's not always, but usually all the columns except the last one are the ones that are features, and then the last one is a feature. So this is kind of like a shortcut. And then this says, give me all, uh, give me all the rows um, and the last column. So you will get only this column. So let's run this and hope for the best. All right, works. Okay, so now we have to uh, split the data up. And um, if you ever did like TDD or BDD, test driven development, uh, you have to test your code. And testing your code means that you're proven, uh, there's a, kind of like an experiment, there's a way for you to prove that your code works besides just clicking on a browser or clicking on an app or whatever you're doing. In machine learning, we split our data and we say, okay, I'm gonna do my training with 80% of my data and then I'm gonna hide 20% of the data from my model. And then when I finish training my model, I, when, I, when I find the line, right, if you think about, remember that line, when I find the line, I will, I will test my model on this data that it hasn't seen before. And it will really tell me, does it work or not? Um, so that's kind of the, the basics. There are other techniques, you know, people use something called a, a training, testing, and cross-validation data set. And there's a whole, you know, spiel about it, but in simple terms, you can just use that when you're starting up. Okay, so the, in order for me to, yeah, and the common like percentage of, there's like a rule of thumb. If you don't, don't know what your percentage of training and test data should be, it's 20% testing, 80% training. But you know, that again varies based on the person and who you ask, but kind of, I found that um, that works best for me in most cases. Sometimes it doesn't, but most cases it does. Um, and I, this is hand dandy method, handy dandy method called train test split, which basically allows me to do that without doing it manually. I, I mean, I did it manually before, but it is a lot easier. There's no point in me uh, doing that. All right, so let's do that. Okay. By the way, this is gonna be all of my GitHub and my GitHub is gonna be in the last few slides. So if you wanna take a look at it, feel free. Um, so there's also this thing called random state, which there's some randomness in the regression algorithm and in order to get the same results when I run it, I'm just passing this through. In production, you shouldn't do that, but for the demo purposes, it's good. And then um, train test split returns four things. It returns X train, X test, Y train, Y test. So X train, Y train, those are the pairs that we're gonna train with. Uh, X test are the things that we're gonna test against. And our algorithm is going to predict things based on X test and we're gonna compare it to um, Y test. All right, let's do that. So, boop. Uh, we're gonna instantiate linear regression and we're gonna do something called fit. Um, okay, let's see if this works. Okay, it did, great. Um, so what we did here, what fit does is you can think of it as it's trying to find that line. You know, it's doing a bunch of stuff, it's going to gradient descent, and it does all that for you. Um, now it found the line the best that it could based on X train and Y train, and now we're gonna test our model and see how it works. How am I doing on time? Does anybody know? 10.28. And what's the? 45. Oh, oh, nice, plenty of time, plenty of time, all right. Uh, I was like, don't, let, don't make me do math on stage, man. Uh, okay, so this. All right. So this is gonna take the, uh, the, um, the hidden data, the features of the hidden data, and it's gonna say, okay, give me all the salaries you think we have based on these years of experience. So we're gonna run that. And let's take a look at that. And then let's take a look at uh, Y test, which is the one that we we're kind of comparing against. Okay, so, you know, the first one is 37,000 in real one, and the, predictions in, the prediction is 41,000. So not bad, not great, you know, it's all right. Second one is 12, 12 is here, you know, one, two, you know, one, two, two, one, two, three, pretty okay. Um, this one is 57, 65, not great, uh, 63, 63, pretty good. So overall, it's not, it's a, and it's an okay model, right? But in order to kind of 
really understand it. I like to visualize things when I can. Sometimes you can't visualize things, but if it's a 2D, you know, if you can kind of get it to 2D or 3D space, uh, it's always nice to see what's going on. So let's run this. And we have red dots, which are the ones that we're training. Can you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you definitely can. <laughs> uh, so you have red dots, which are the ones that we trained on. You have blue dots, uh, which are the ones that are testing data set. And then you have orange dots. These are the interesting ones. So this is where our model thinks salaries are. And this is what they actually are, right? So for example, here, my, our model says our salary is this and the actual value is this. So that's pretty close, right? Uh, here, it's, you know, if you can see there's two dots, um, this dot and this dot kind of say, okay, you know, our model said our salary should be this, it's actually this, so that's pretty good. There's almost a 100% overlap, and then this one is way off. I mean, it's not way off, it's close, but uh, it's, it's more off than this one. And then here, it's kind of the same thing, and here, if you can see our model, it's almost 100% overlap, but then there's two of these that are off because these two are here. Um, and that's about it for the demo. Okay, so next part is one of my favorite parts where I talk about what I do in my free time, which is machine learning. I'm kidding. Actually, no, I'm kidding. But I, I also do other stuff. Uh, I like to train dogs. Um, I train working dogs. It's a sport. If you want to know more about it, let me know. But, you know, work with German Shepherds, Belgian Malinois, love dogs. Um, this is my GitHub, my Twitter, and my blog, which, frankly, I blog a lot less than I used to. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of prepping a three three-part series in startups, that I, what I learned about startups. So um, you can find that there. And if you want to talk to me, probably the best way is Twitter. I can give you my email, but it takes me like a week to go through all my email. Uh, and it also takes me a few days to get to um, your Twitter probably. But you know, I'll, I promise I'll try to respond to everyone if, if, if you message me. And I um, work for a company called ScriptDrop. Uh, we're here in town. We're local. We're hiring. I have uh, my business cards with me, but we're hiring security people, we're hiring uh, devs, we're hiring business people. So if you want a job, let me know. Uh, it's right here. Um, and now it's Q&A time. Anybody got questions? Go for so it. My question is divided into two parts. Nice, I like those questions, uh, my favorite. So how much of A, Maths um, is required um, to know as a machine learning engineer. And second is how much of machine learning does this engineer must know? Right. So, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this. All right. Just kidding. It's more than this, but this is a lot more than you think it is. So, a lot of so the first answer to the question is, you have to grow your knowledge as you go. Uh, you can't just, I mean, you can, but you can't just sit down and go and do a graduate degree in math and then, okay, I know all the math. Uh, you can do it that way, but it's, you know, I like to optimize things and do both things at the same time. Um, so a lot of, a lot of um, machine learning is matrix multiplication. People will tell you otherwise, but that's all there is. Now, to understand why that is, you need to have a lot of knowledge. So knowing linear algebra, knowing calculus, knowing um, a little bit of statistics, those things help a lot. When I started out, I first did a, like a general machine, like, okay, so I did AI in, in college. So I have a computer science degree, we did it there, so I was kind of familiar with things, but I forgot a lot. Like, Last time I did AI when I started out was like four years ago, right? So I forgot a lot about it. So I knew the basics. I kind of knew how it works very roughly. But I started with a very general machine learning course that kind of took me through, okay, these are all the parts that we do nowadays. And, and um, this is how we do them. Um, and this is how you kind of implement them in Python. And then I kind of flipped the thing. And then I did a, 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 machine, a, a math course that does calculus and statistics. And then... I went the other way and then I did, you know, so you just kind of, as you run into problems, like for example, like practical example, I was doing something called time series analysis, which basically says what's, so we were trying to predict um, 
what the price of a product is going to be based on the historical price of a product. And there's a bunch of statistics there. And some of the terms, like I listened to a few, I did that before, but fairly simple. Never did it really for prod or for production. And then when I actually dug deep into it, there were just words I didn't understand. So what that required is sitting two weeks and watching Khan Academy and learning about statistics. And that's just how it is. And you know, when the guys like Andrew Ung and Jeremy Howard, who are considered fathers of machine learning, pretty much the modern fathers of machine learning, and like, you know, the guys from Facebook, you know, they just really do the same thing. Like, they just go and do the thing, and then when they understand, they learn about it. And, you know, having a PhD in math helps, and statistics helps, but you don't really have to have that. You can learn as you go, but, you know, having basics and having the ground knowledge, like, for example, doing a course on math, statistics, like AP math, AP, you know, the, the high school level math, and maybe a little bit of college level math too, and statistics helps. So you have to, you know, once you have that, everything above that is like, you know, oh, what is, what is, you know, time series, and how does, you know, lag work, and, you know, move, exponentially weighted moving average, you know, it, it took me a while to figure exponentially weighted moving average. So just kind of go as you, as you do, and, and have the basics done, and then just go see how it happens. But that's, you know, that's not a perfect, there's no like, oh, do yes, do these five things and you'll be, got, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, let you know that uh, you have any specific uh, experience in a real project and you go to the air group and then you find out, you know, air group won't work and how you go about resolving that. So like, for example, you predict a uh, salary. Yeah. Actually, linear regression may not work though because Eventually, your salary will you more, have more spin that drop down. Yeah, so I didn't so really... So how do you fix that, fix that problem? So, so I, and I haven't like, really understood half of the question, but in, I'm going to re reinterpret it and let me know if I'm right. So how do you debug models? Is that a question? How do you debug things and how do you... No, no, no. What I'm talking about is like, based on your experience, do you have any real project first? And, and you found out your algorithm... Your, uh, my algorithm doesn't work, yeah. So how do you go about fixing it or change the record? Yeah, you know, you're not going to like the answer. Linear depression, right? <laughs> yeah. So science, experiments. Okay. So I, I, you know, there are systems that track your performance of your models. You know, you put it in production, turns out it doesn't work. You go back and you debug it. Uh, what does debugging mean? You, so there's a lot of, you know, thing, you know things that I can say that, might not make a lot of sense, but you know, adjusting your learning rate, your biases, your weights, your um, your weight decay, regularization, overfitting, underfitting, like just you know, there's a set of things that you have to try and see what happens. It's not like programming in software engineering when you're like, ah, I haven't instantiated a class, or oh, I didn't write. It's a typo. Like, no, it that usually like a typo is going to happen way before you put it in production. So. Um, it's more about poking and seeing what happens if it doesn't work. And there are a set of like rules of thumb of like, okay, th these 10 things usually make models better. And you try all the 10 things and one of them will make it better. And then you go back, something goes wrong, then you can do it again, and then you do it again. And you just kind of just keep iterating and automating things that you can. Some things can be autom cannot be automated and just keep going. So whenever we have a problem, uh, and my, uh, I also have a consult. Like I, I had a consulting company, and whenever I was doing machine learning projects for people, it's really like that's all that you can do. So any real project you you can give us an example or something? Yeah, I mean, just recently, we uh, we deployed an ARIMA model, which is time series model, um, and it only worked when there's upward trend or downward trend. So we were predicting things great when there's an upward or downward trend, but when data was stationary, when it was going like this, it sucked at predicting. So why is that? Well, we're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we, we've gotten pretty close. Um, it has to do with differencing, but you know, that's, nobody wants to talk about that right now. But uh, uh, we figured it out though. Uh, we're getting better and we're, we're getting close and it's like, we also wrote a recommendation engine that does like recommend recommend certain things for Tableau, and um, you know it works great. Sometimes it doesn't, 
uh, but most of the times it does. And that's why it's like people find it frustrating that that you know there's not like, and I do sometimes. There's not really a, a, a great answer for everything all the time, and it's especially because this whole thing is just in its infancy, and we're still all trying to figure it out. Uh, but uh, basically, to answer your question, we had a problem with Arima. We went back to the drawing board, ran a bunch of, we have a bunch of Jupyter notebooks. We do a bunch of experiments, see what happens, adjust the things, and kind of. That doesn't mean you should blindly poke at it. You should know where you're poking at, but still poking and seeing. Yes, sir. So, uh, you talked about problem solving. You said data gathering and then picking the algorithm. So for someone who's just getting started with machine learning and you have the data, is there like libraries that have algorithms already or are you always creating that algorithm? So I didn't create the algorithm here. Okay. Uh, I use something called a... So in practice, you never create your own algorithm. Um, you, like, unless, you know, unless you're like a data, like a researcher in Google, and it's trying to push the numbers a little bit up. So there's a, for learning, you should. Like, you know, I created my own gradient descent plenty of times, and you should do it because it really helps you understand all the pieces. Um, but there's a few libraries, uh, you know, TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Sidekick Learn, that should get you plenty enough um, to work off. Yes? What are your comments on? Sorry. No, go on, go, no, go for it. I what just remember. What are your comments on AutoML and how it's going to affect So, I am a big fan of neural networks and I'm a big fan of uh, automating things. Um, I think. People overestimate, you know, humans and, and how well can we do feature engineering. But I also, I think some of the parts will be automated, and some of the models can be guessed pretty well. But for certain problems, you'll just have to kind of poke at it and see what. I mean, there's an autom ML talk just coming up, and you should definitely go there and see what that's all about. In my experience, I, I, um, I, I automate things when I have to, and when I think it's going to be more efficient. And when I don't, I just don't. <coughs> so, I don't really have an opinion about it yet, if that makes any sense. I, I, I'm, I'm looking and seeing what happens, kind of like most of everything else. Uh, but um, it's interesting. But I don't think it will oh, change everything in order to using a lot of ML, at least not for now. Yes, he was first. Maybe to expand upon that question. So if you could, maybe talk about some use cases where you know, traditional machine learning, say with scikit learn is more appropriate than saying just going for a deep learning solution like my Twitch. So 95% of my problems could be solved with deep learning. Um, five other percent is probably random forests. Um, but um, there are times when, uh, like most of my, like, um, like Arima, for example, time series, uh, it's just becoming uh, people, people are trying out. Uh, a few people are trying out a few things um, with time series and neural networks. So, but we didn't use that. We just used a statistical model. It wasn't even psychic learning. It was something else. It doesn't. I don't remember. Whatever. But uh, they're, they're, um, you know, neural networks are really great at what they do is because they can approximate everything, and uh, with enough resources, you can you you can just get good results, and um, you don't have to do a lot of feature engineering. That's the biggest bottleneck, in my opinion, for machine learning, is just like figuring out what those axes should be, because you're not, even though you have columns, you know, salary, blah, 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 th that doesn't mean those columns should be in your model. Uh, figuring out which ones should be is really hard, and sometimes doesn't make any sense. So neural networks don't have that problem, um, and uh, that's why they're so good, in my opinion. Yes, sir. So I want to use like machine learning in like a sports kind of application. Like, what would I need? Like, what algorithms do you think? Ooh, that's a. Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> depends. It all depends. What are you trying to solve? Is it a, is it a vision problem? You know, are you trying to predict what type of? You want to predict like scores or like. Yeah. So that's so so. Um, you can use neural networks. You can you know there's a deep you know there's a. It's called tabular data. 
Um, so you can use no nouns for that. You could also use, uh, because they're, um, I got it, I'm just going to. Um, you could use the um, psychic learn. It has a few really good libraries for predicting things based on uh, um, kind of label data and, and stuff like that. So. Question uh, back to the learning piece. Uh, there are a lot of resources online to learn machine learning. There's yeah. Which ones have you used? Which ones do you recommend? So there's a, um, there's a course um, on Coursera called uh, Introduction to Machine Learning. It's by Andrew Ung. It's from Stanford. That's really good one. Uh, if I was starting out, I would probably just first do, there's a course called Essential Math and Statistics for Machine Learning on EDX. I would do that first. And then I would go and do Introduction to Machine Learning by Andrew Ng. And then I would do something called Deep Learning Specialization by Andrew Ng. And then I would do Jeremy Howard Deep Learning course. Um, and that should be two years. So you're good. At least for me, it took a long time. Yep. Um, I find that feature engineering is the most difficult part yes. in just understanding what the problem is. So how do I better understand or better feature? Use deep learning. <laughs> I mean, I don't really have a right answer for that. I just don't, uh, I, just, I, I am sometimes, like, depends on the problem. I sometimes suck at it. You know, it's just hard. Uh, you don't really know. Like, I, I, I can guess, and there are rules. I mean, there's, there's all these techniques to reduce the amount of dimensions that you have, like PCA, or it's called principal component analysis. And what it does is, instead of having 10 features, you have three, and now all of a sudden, the problem is easier to comprehend. And, you know, sometimes it's just by trying to, like, do a square of your years of experience and then do a, um, you know, square square, then, you know, it's just experiments. Like, I don't, I don't have, depends on the problem. I don't have, I, I have a hunch what is going to help, but I don't, I, if I don't know a problem, it's really hard to figure out what that is. All right, anything else? Um, I'll have my uh, few, if you're interested, I have my um, cards out, um, hiring a bunch of developers. So, you know, there's a link there. Well, it's actually a really cool card. Um, but yeah, um, let me, yeah, we're using Elixir. So if you're into that sort of stuff, it's pretty great. All right, thank you guys.